Welcome to the Babylon 5 version of a Lower Decks episode. I'm your host, the Lower Decker. Lower Deck... Wow, that's... that's. I actually didn't do that on purpose. Um, <laughs> a Lower Decks episode, for those of you who haven't heard me use the term before, is named after the February 7th, 1994 episode of Star Trek Next Generation, called The Lower Decks, which is a fairly typical episode which uses different viewpoint characters or slants it in a different way so that we are seeing things from the ground view and the it's not just shifting the camera per se but shifting the perspective so that things are shown in a new light and we can see things differently it, and it tends to add to a story at least when it's done well I tend to be quite a big fan of Lower Deck style stories at least when they are done well of course this one's a little bit different than your typical Lower Decks episode because it feels more like... I mean, I mean, it's not... It, I'm not saying it's bad and I'm not saying it's not Lower Decks, but in this case, rather than completely shifting the angle and watching the events from over here, it's more like we're watching the events and then we shift, and then we shift, and then we shift, and we keep shifting perspectives as we go through it because the camera is still following the main cast members as they're giving about half of their overall dialogue to each other and then shifts back to... Our, you know, our main characters for the episode, Bo and Mac. I actually uh, found Bo and Mac rather endearing. Apparently, what both actors had done is they had gone off stage and just sat there practicing their lines until there's there was sort of a natural flow to the banter as they were talking to each other. And it and it does show. It it, it is very much something that you can just feel in the way that they're talking back and forth. And they need to go get some spoo. Uh, <laughs> I do. Uh, I, I, one of the other things, though, that's really weird about this episode is, on paper, I shouldn't like this episode. I really shouldn't, uh, for a couple of big reasons, not the least of which being the fact that the Necrons are... I'm sorry, I'll explain that joke in a minute, I swear, but... Well, <laughs> you're probably thinking Warhammer. That's not what I mean. Just Ah, oh, screw it, I'll explain it right now. So the episode includes... These Doom aliens who have this Doom expeditionary fleet, which is Doom powerful, and there's Doom seeking around to Doom conquer er territories, and there's this big crisis of the week to defeat them. And these aliens are probably one of the closest things we've seen to bad guys of the week on Babylon 5. Now, anybody who's seen my Voyager stuff knows that I can't stand the concept of the bad guy of the week, because I feel it's... It's stupid, and it's, I mean, I've, I've talked about it so many times, I, don't, I, I feel redundant even bringing it up. But these guys are literally bad guys of the week. They, we don't even know their names. They're never mentioned before or since, unless there's something in the books or comics that I never was aware of. They're just, ah, okay, we're beaten. And that's it. Some big doom empire. Some conquering force that we've never heard of before, and is never mentioned again, just comes in and threatens us and then leaves. Okay. I call them the Necrons because me and my friends who were watching Babylon 5 on TNT at this point when this was coming out also happened to be into... Well, okay. this I'm, I'm actually saying the wrong story here. I'm sorry. I should skip forward just a bit because I just realized that's the wrong time frame. Because this came out on February 11th of 1998. No, when I was actually really watching this with my friends because at the time it was just me and Mum watching Babylon 5. But when I was watching through Babylon 5 with my friends, that would have been closer to like 2005. <laughs> so at about 2005, I'm watching through Babylon 5 with my friends, and these aliens come out of nowhere like, whoa, we're this big threat. And one of my buddies makes the immediate comment that, oh my god, it's Necron! For those of you who don't get it, Necron is the last boss of Final Fantasy IX, and while this can be argued, depending on what you learn from the Ultimania, or you consider the thematic significance of FF9, he is pretty much comes out of nowhere. Just, I'm the boss! Okay. <laughs> and so we, we just kind of started calling these guys the Necrons. Now, at the time, I didn't actually know about the Necrons from Warhammer. So this just kind of got even funnier as time went on. But I've been in the habit of calling the, these random space get bad guys from nowhere the Necrons ever since, so... 
Take from that what you will. If I accidentally call them that, that's not really on purpose. The other thing about this episode related to the Necrons is that this feels like a season one episode. Not in terms of quality. Because, again, I should hate this episode, but I don't. It is extremely well acted, extremely well presented. Again, the, the actors playing Mac and Bo did a great job of their roles. And it was nice doing the shifting in and out perspective thing that they did throughout the course of the episode. It also had an overall humorous and lighthearted tone. It was basically a comedy episode with a couple of breaks into something more serious. Basically just the two breaks into something more serious. And I liked that. And I liked its presentation. And I enjoyed rewatching it. But this is a season one episode. Aside from the fact that they acknowledge certain character arcs, nothing really happens that's connected to anything else. They mention Lockley, and they talk about uh, how her her past and which side she was on during the insurrection is, is something that's brought up. And this is actually a good way to mention that, because most of the upper staff either are going to have questioned her directly about it, which they already have, or... Ignore it, which they already have. But the Lower Decks people are just going to be like, oh man, what do you think? And they're going to toss rumors back and forth. But of course, those rumors are not truth. I'll talk more about the Lockley thing when it finally really comes to a head. Let's just say that I think this was a good way to introduce that, but it wasn't introduced here. We'll get to it. Uh, we also see what it's like, one of the benefits of being the anti-politician, like Sheridan is, because if you're that kind of person, you're probably going to have a lot of popular support. Now, popular support's value varies significantly, and depends on a thousand different circumstances that can't really be tracked particularly effectively. It may be that with your popular support, you can outride, you know, override and outweigh, you know, the politicians, the actual politicians and, and the military and all that stuff. It might be that the popular support gets you nothing because they're not actually willing to do anything. It might be that the politicians are afraid of the populist and therefore will counter your whims, etc. And there's a dozen different permutations of those concepts. But we do see here that anti-politician Sheridan has populist support. That's not exactly something new. He's been known for being someone who gets along with his people pretty commonly. And it goes back to what Sheridan himself says. Maybe if more leaders actually walked the halls of the people they lead, they would do a better job of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see Franklin. Now, the one bit that was really amazing as far as... Uh, well, I shouldn't say the one bit. There's actually a lot of bits. Franklin dumps some backstory about why he became a doctor, which would have fit better back in season one, but whatever. He talks about how his dad and, and these troops had been kept held captive by an enemy force. And there's no reason to keep them alive, but the enemy doctor had insisted on keeping them alive because the enemy doctor was a doctor. Like, in, in the positive term of that, in, in what we usually think of when we think of the ideology of a doctor. Then, and, and he talks about, you know, that's, that's the moment I realized that that's what I want to do. I want to be the person who saves even the enemy lives. And it's a very powerful, very moving scene that makes a lot of sense and explains so much about Franklin's perspective. I wonder why we didn't get this four seasons ago, but other than that, it even ends properly, as horrible as this sounds, because... He died. The doctor who kept them alive was executed for being a traitor. And that is what should happen there. It is an interesting concept, though. The powerful idea of universal concepts. You know, you may be the enemy today. That does not mean you'll be the enemy tomorrow. That does not mean I have to actively seek your death, etc. And there is some naivete in the idea of saving the life of your enemy especially since usually what that's going to lead to is that enemy turning against you or your people in the future. But there is still something strong in clinging to that ideology in the face of reality. Some people would call that foolishness. Some people would call that faith. Take it what you will. It, it's up to you to decide, Babylon 5 as ever. lets us determine how we perceive things. But I do think it is interesting that Franklin is that committed to that concept because of seeing it so demonstrably presented. 
Because it would have been so easy for a young band to look at that and be like, oh, there's alien scum, or oh, God, I can't believe that happened, or oh, he was killed, what a fool. No, he was like, no, that's me, I want to do that. So I mentioned the Lockley thing. Again, we'll get to that later. There's this... I mentioned this is a comedy episode. There's this great bit where there is a battle waging. They are actively attacking. And there, there's... And you see it in the background. And they're like, all right, you need us for anything else? Nope. Okay. We're finished for now. We're going to go ahead and take a break. Ah, oh, yeah. And they just kind of sit there and relax. While Babylon 5 was under attack while there is an invasion happening. I like it because, of, ignoring the obvious comedic tones, it helps to not... It helps to emphasize that even though, you know, it's, oh my god, it's always this big, great crisis of the week, it's kind of normal to the people who aren't usually on camera. It helps pull it away from soap opera, basically. It's too easy to be like, oh my god, this is the worst thing ever! Every time, you know, some big alien force invades, it's better to, in my opinion, to try and bring it down to Earth a little bit. Like, oh, another alien force is invading. All right. Well, whatever. There's also this great bit uh, with Byron. Before we get into it, actually, I want to I wanna mention something. I want you to pay attention to how Byron talks about and, and mentions immediate death. You know, the, the being present as a telepath when someone dies and immediately thereafter. And I want you to look at how Byron speaks and how he says it, how he's enthusiastic, how he's got so much energy and he's, he's excited about this. Compared to Lita in one of the previous episodes, uh, it was the last one of the last, last one, I'm kind of lost track here, where she's, te she's shaking and she's messed up and she doesn't even want to deal with it and she doesn't even want to think about it and she talks in, in horrified, quiet tones about how messed up it is being in, in someone's mind when they're dying. Now that's, being in someone's mind and being present when they're dying are different things but I do think it is still significant the vastly varied tone between the two. Also, quick question. What exactly do you think Byron did when it came to uh, when it came to Bo because he puts him it, it, you, you could say that he created the illusion of being out there or maybe you could say that he actually put him in the mind of someone out there or he, and this is an interesting theory that I've heard most commonly one of the theories is that he puts him into the mind of someone who is dying and so he transfers himself out there into the mind of someone who is actively dying, and therefore that's why it lasts only for a little bit, because, you know, he, he's only got a few seconds of life left, and then, you know, ship is destroyed and moving on. I don't know if that's actually true or not, and it would, given that there's usually limits on telepaths like line of sight and range, uh, that would imply some interesting things about Byron's capacities if it's true. It is probably most likely true that Byron simply gave him the, the image of it, the illusion of it, if you will. One of the interesting things to me, though, is that Byron repeats that question. Is, does it matter to you? Is it important to you? You know, his, his motivation and his, his modus operandi becoming more and more apparent. But I mention that because I find it that Bo gets to the point where he no longer wants to be that. Like, he's like, I want to be out there fighting with our men. And then he sees it, and the violence is not glorified. Instead, it is horrifying to him, and he no longer wants to have anything to do with it. It's a subtle thing. They only really touch on it the two times, but it's a nice touch. So then we see Londo and Jakar, who are, again, awesome. Admittedly, this is the one bit that wouldn't quite fit in season one, because the clear and obvious camaraderie between the two is amazing, and you couldn't really have had that back in season one where the two were actually antagonistic towards each other. But at the same time, once again, just like with Franklin, we learn new things about these characters in season five that would have probably been better served a little bit earlier on in the series. Like, for example, Shikar growing up in the bomb shelters, and Londo arguably not growing up at all. I do find it interesting, the, the cultural contrast there, because Jakar grew up in an oppressed society, and so did Londo, just in a different way. 
uh, Jacquard's was a lot more literal, whereas Londo, well, I mean, to be blunt, we've done that in real life history. Oh, new child, all right, immediately take him away, immediately, you know, it, especially if it's a male heir, my goodness, we have to immediately make sure that this child knows his duties and responsibilities. He'll be assuming the throne in three years, you know, that kind of a thing. That whole, you are part of a politically connected family, so you don't actually have your life. You don't own your life. The family owns your life. The nobility owns your life. The duty to the state owns your life. So it's an interesting back and forth. And then, of course, they talk about, and this is one thing I like that Babylon 5 does periodically. They acknowledge the realism, I guess is the best way to put it, of this situation. You have a big space battle. You need, to go, you need to go out there and clean all that up. There's a lot of debris that needs to be taken care of, and a lot of bodies that need to be brought in, too. And it is a mess. And, and, and free-floating debris around a space station, that's not a good thing. That's, that's something that does need to be taken care of. So that makes sense. And then it cuts to Franklin, who is identifying the bodies. You know, it's always our mess to clean up. And then it immediately cuts to that. Once again, helping to emphasize that it is not, even though it is an everyday thing, it is still something that is not pleasant. It's not glorified. It's not normalized in the sense that it becomes irrelevant. It is simply normal because it is an everyday concept. Then, of course, you know, there's the, there's the bit with Delan and there's the bit with Sheridan. I don't really have much to add there. It's just some nice stuff. And uh, his, the only thing that struck me as weird was when Mac actually sits down and is like, hey, you're okay in my book, to Captain Lockley. I actually feel like that was put in there specifically to help either the actress or the audience to be like, yeah, Lockley's okay. I'm not really sure. I don't have any proof of that. It just seems like a weird thing to be tossed in there. In character, it's obvious what's happening, you know, because there's lots of rumors circulating about her. But... It is kind of just... The presentation of it, it feels like they put just a little bit too much of a spotlight on it. It should have been like, hey, you all right in my book? And then go back to it, you know. Instead, it's like, hey, Captain, pause. Camera focus. Yes? Camera focus. Pause. Well, I just wanted to say you're okay in my book. Pause. Reaction. Too much time was spent on it uh, for it to be not significant. Again, probably to the audience, but I got nothing. So that's been this episode. I want to mention one last thing about this. I mentioned the season one thing. I've talked about that several times. And it's not just the fact that it introduced concepts that should have been in season one or that, that it doesn't move anything forward per se. It's the fact that it has nothing to do with anything. This episode is another episode. That, that That's actually one of the points of a Lower Decks concept is that it's a normal episode. It's just different perspective. And this episode does that. And admittedly, you know, an everyday episode like this, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you're going to do an, what is basically a filler episode like this, it's good filler, so this would be, you know, uh, it's leveling instead of padding, it's leveling instead of grinding, I don't know what else to call this right now, it is good filler. But it is still a filler episode. It doesn't move anything forward. It doesn't advance the story. It's like a standard Star Trek episode where the continuity is existent, but not really string continuity. It's not really part of an arc or a story or anything, really. The only arc that has any significance in this episode, and this is heavily debatable, is the fact that they are once again bringing up the Lockley thing with regard to the Earth's insurrection. So, that's it. This is why I say it would be better suited in earlier in Babylon 5's history, back when doing, you know, standalone episodes like this was a more normal thing because we were still getting used to the crew and the, the, the uh, cast, the setting, and we didn't really start doing the major story arcs yet. And I mention this because this is something Season 5 does now and again. It has standalone episodes. And that just isn't what I like about Babylon 5. I'm not saying it's a bad episode. And again, I actually praise this episode. It's a great episode. But that isn't why I watch Babylon 5. If I wanted a good series that had standalone episodes, i got a dozen other series I can go watch for that. I want the big arcs. I want string continuity. I want significance and moving forward with the story and characters and plot. 
just my thoughts. I, I imagine a lot of people disagree with me on this, but that's okay, because as ever, I love hearing your thoughts, and I hope to see you guys next time. Chukru.